I hated people. Um, uh, you know, I think I was probably a racist. I didn't like people that didn't like, look like me, dress like me, act like me, all that stuff. Like I, I was sexually immoral growing mm -hmm. up. Uh, so yeah, my, my life before Jesus, I think was, was poor on one side, but spiritually poor. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and this is the podcast where we talk about things that matter. This is a conversation with a, a fellow YouTuber, a friend. Uh, it's a kind of content creator testimonial. Uh, we're going to be finding out a little bit more about the Chicano Knox. He's a husband and a father. Uh, his testimony coming to Christ and his reason for YouTube. I hope you enjoy this conversation, that it's good, helpful, and edifying. Enjoy. Chicano Knox, how you doing, brother? Welcome yo, to the yo, show. Yo, yo, man, what's going on, man? Welcome, welcome. It's yeah. good to see you face to face. And we've been here and there in the YouTube streets and checked out each other's channels a bit. Uh, well, why don't you why don't you share a little bit about who you are? I know you. Uh, when I first met you via uh, YouTube, uh, a lot of your testimony was similar to mine, and kind of linked up, both being from California. Just kind of tell us uh, coming to Christ and and how what brought you to the Lord, and uh, and tell us about that. Yeah, man. Well, first of all, thank you so much for bringing me on, man. Um, it's a blessing. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm excited. Uh, you yeah, know, it's a... been a while since I've uh, talked about my uh, my journey to Christ. Uh, you know, uh, but you know, I, I, I like to uh, you know, as I was thinking about it, because um, it's been a while. But um, I like to make a little, just a little quick disclosure. You know, because I. I want to I want to make I want to point out that there is a difference I believe between what is the gospel and what a testimony is you know because mm -hmm. I don't think my testimony is the gospel sure and they they are different and so I want to point that out you know and and there's a lot of things about my testimony that people could hear and be like yes that's great uh, maybe some people might hear and be like I have you know I ne I don't have no experience with it I don't relate to this. Uh, that's why the gospel is the big thing about my story. As I was thinking about it, um, my story is basically a journey of how I came to know the real gospel. And, you know, that I, I just want to point out that the gospel is what saved me. And it wasn't my works or it wasn't my my efforts or anything like that. And it's only because of Jesus is where I am, where I am, you know, sitting sitting in this chair is because of Jesus. And, and it's not because of 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 a system or anything like that uh, i don't boast that just because i am where i am uh i don't boast in my any backing backgrounds anything like that um if you would have met me 15 years ago you know what i mean i, I was a different creature different <laughs> different <laughs> different type know. of person absolutely yeah. so i want to give jesus all the credit and i want to make sure that folks listening understand that my testimony even though you may not relate to it, is it's just a journey of how I came to know the Lord Jesus. And I just wanted to make that point that out real quick. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, I was born in Southern Arizona um, in 88. Um, and then immediately, you know, I was taken to um, Santa Ana, um, California, which is in Orange County, mm -hmm. um, the 714. So I was there until 16 years old. So you know, I went to middle school in California. I went to high school in California. Uh, you know, I was raised by a single mother. Um, I'm, I'm I'm the one of three, so I have two sisters. Um, I'm the only boy. I'm the baby of the family. Uh, my my oldest sister uh, did pass away in 2006 from leukemia. Mm -hmm. So now it's just me and my 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 um second oldest sister. And we're like 10 years apart. So yeah, I was raised in California for 16 years up until the freshman year of high school um you know i was raised in a traditional mexican home in in california with um all the good things that comes with that which is like good food good holidays and a lot of good stuff very festive yeah. very Amen. very festive um but with that comes with the traditional roman catholic stuff um and that's the the up, upbringing that i was um in uh <laughs> If you want to, if you want to say what religion did you come from, I guess the closest thing would be, you know, the Roman Catholic stuff. And but you know, looking back at it, 
you know, I thought many years, like, was I really taught the gospel by my mom? Was I catechized? Did, did I learn anything? Um, I don't think so. I, I think she did my, I think she did her best, obviously. You know, we, gr we grew up very poor, uh, government baby, food stamps, welfare, Section 8, uh, you know, homeless at one point, all these things, man. Wow. And it, it was a hard life. Uh, one time for Christmas, I only got uh, what's a, I don't remember what I got, but I think I only got one one little thing. And you know, I was like, man, this Christmas is horrible. <laughs> but yeah, you know, as I grew up, I, I started noticing that yeah, we were poor, man. And uh, so, but I grew up with the moralistic gospel. If mm. I want to point it and put it somewhere on the map, it was very basic. It was, don't do drugs, uh, don't join the gangs, don't be like your cousins. Uh, do good in school and then uh, love God and um, obey your mom, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And when I look at it now, those those principles are are, are are OK. You do want your kids to obey you. You, you. you don't want your kids to do drugs. You don't want your kids to join gangs. I get it. But that's not the gospel It's very more moralistic. It's not the gospel. So that but that's the gospel I was given growing up. That's the message I heard. Uh, morally. And, you know, I was never taught the biblical gospel. Obviously, I was never discipled by a, an older man. You know, I never uh, met my dad until I was 16. So mm -hmm. I was given every single boogeyman a Mexican mother would give its child. You know, <laughs> the drugs, the gangs, don't run away from home. Don't be like yeah. your, your, your cousin, you know, or your, your uncle Popeye. Don't do that. You know what I mean? So I was given boogeyman's all my life, like go to sleep or the boogeyman will get you. <laughs> so like, I was given <laughs> moralisms, man. Yeah. And I know it's funny for people, but it, it really is. It, it was a moralistic society culture I was raised in. Um, and imagine being raised in that. Imagine being raised in that with no discipleship. Uh, my mom trying the best she could. And, and guess what I chose left up to my sinful nature. I chose rebelliousness. Mm -hmm. I chose to befriend a lot of those boogeymen. And I lived a very delinquent lifestyle. So everything that the moralistic gospel that I've learned and all the boogeymen and all the fences that my mom tried her best to put up, you know, um, you know, I, I broke through all those moralistic fences fairly easily. Um, just left to myself and my own devices and the own my own sinful things that I chose to 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 seep in uh, you know so i lived a rebellious very delinquent lifestyle um i i you know i, I think looking back at it even though I, I i was you know baptized in the roman catholic church you know the two biggest birthdays in in the, in the mexican family is like the seventh when, when you when a boy turns seven you get catechized you get you get baptized when you're seven first communion or whatever it's called yeah. and then when and for the women it's uh the 15 years old, the quinceanera, you know, and for me, it was like seven, you know, catechize and uh, the first communion and all that stuff. And, and you know, that's it. And, and it's not really a communion thing. It's more of like a drinking thing. It's more of a party. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, I grew up, I think, a practical atheist. Like, even though I believe there was God, my mom told me about, you know, Jesus Cristo and the Virgen de Guadalupe and all these pray the rosaries, you know, do this every time you pass the... A Catholic church, even though I knew there was a God, my mom told me, um, and I think he was real. He was never like real in my life, like in yeah. my practical day to day life. And, and now looking back at it, I knew I lived a practical atheist life because my lifestyle reflected my beliefs, you know, if that makes sense. And I was very prideful growing up. I hated authority. I disrespected the rules of my mother, for example. I, I didn't like my teachers. Um, I was autonomous. Um, I liked a very independent lifestyle. I liked independence. And because of, I think, being raised the way I was raised, I was forced to gr grow up faster than I should have, be independent more than I should have been. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I was introduced. I was introduced to things that, that I should have never been introduced to at that age, I think. So it created an independent uh, mechanism in, in my life, in my thinking. And mm -hmm. I dislike, therefore, I became comfortable with that. And I dislike conformity. 
I didn't like to conform and I didn't like to follow rules. So mm. naturally I, I broke God's rules. I, you know, I was a liar. Uh, I stole, I stole many things, uh, expensive things, small things, petty things. I hated people. Um, uh, you know, I think I was probably a racist. I didn't like people that didn't like, look like me, dress like me, act like me, all that stuff. Like I, I was sexually immoral growing mm. up. Uh, so yeah, my, my life before Jesus, I think was was poor on one side, but spiritually poor, reflecting my 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 physical estate. I, you know, and if if left in that situation, if Jesus didn't intervene and save me, I think I was on a path of you know statistically proven. I was thinking on I was on the path of prison or worse. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So I think that's the that was the path I was on, and um, God came and saved me out of that, man. And you know, I, thankfully, I had enough wisdom and rebelliousness to never join a gang. Mm. But I was always around them, my family's gangs, and all that. I was never in in it, but I was always around it to have enough influence to know the words and culture, be associated. You know, I I like to say I. I my my favorite philosophers before before coming to Jesus were it was not Plato, it was not Socrates, it was not John Locke or C.S. Lewis or anything like that. It, it was uh, people like Tupac, Biggie, N.W.A., Scarface, uh, movies. Uh, th- those were my philosophers. They taught me how to think. They they were my my uh, my teachers, and they they make very poor teachers. And yeah. you know so so true. Yeah. Wow. So that's my life before Christ. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. So what did, well, so what was the turning point then? You said you were 16. Uh, you met your dad for the first time. Um, what was it? Was it a missionary? Did you start going to Bible church, Baptist church, something else? The gospel was preached at the Roman Catholic church. What, here's an aunt. What, what was it? A gospel track that turned you kind of that corner in the Lord showed you showed you himself showed you the gospel yeah absolutely um um so yeah i think i came to an a knowledge of the gospel um <coughs> in, in arizona in arizona in 2006 uh because i was such a <laughs> i was such a delinquent that i think god in his providence took me out of california took took me away you know, the court took me away from my mom. I lost, she lost custody and she kind of gave me up. She says, take him. He doesn't listen. I don't want him. You know, so I, I became embittered to like my mom and authority more because of that. Yeah. And then um, so the court was like, um, we're going to hold him, try to get a hold of his dad. If his dad doesn't get him, then we're going to I don't know what we're going to do with him. Right. So, so you're so, under 18 at this point? Oh, yeah. I was I was a uh, freshman. No, yeah, okay. freshman. Okay, so you were like 14 then. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And and then so my dad comes and, you know, I'm like, you know, I meet him. And then he's like, he tells me the plan. He's like, you're going to be on probation. You know, you're going to have to be here for at least a year, maybe two years in California. And then they give us permission. If you're good, well, you know, I live in Arizona, so we got to go back there. And I was like, you know, so... I took advantage of my dad, you know, because I, I don't know him. So I took advantage of his authority. Uh, I used and abused his, this relationship we had. But, you know, eventually two years passed and we work out a relationship. And then we, we go back to, Arizona, you know, I go back to him. I go back with him to Arizona, Southern Arizona. And, you know, and fast forward all this lifestyle, I keep trending down. And then and then I was involved in uh, music. So I was uh, a promoter. Um, I did a couple, of, you know, shows here and there, very secular hip hop, and and then um, you know, so my my producer in, um, told me to go to a Christian hip hop concert, and I was like, man, I'm not gonna go to a Christian hip hop concert. Like, <laughs> what is that, bro? Like, what in the world? He's like, no, bro, you gotta learn how to network, bro. You gotta learn how to talk to people and like engage. You don't know, you never know. <laughs> I was like. Yeah, you no. never know. Famous last words. <laughs> yeah. So he meant that as a business opportunity. Right. I meant that as like, what? Like, I'm not putting myself in that place. And eventually I gave in and 
all my stereotypes that I had about Christians and, and my uh, preconceived notions all came kind of crashing down to like a shock moment mm. to like, okay, Christian hip hop. I'm like, okay, some of this stuff I'm hearing. Okay. Like this, I guess I, I could vibe with the music, you know, I don't know what they're saying, but I could kind of like, okay, <laughs> I'm familiar. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, saw, I see this one guy, he's from New York, he's from Queens, he's rapping, and then, you know, he comes down, he's smiling, he's, I'm like, why are you smiling, man? Like, what's up with you? Like, what, you know, and he's dressed, you know, a certain way. And I'm like, you don't look like a Christian, you know? And he's like, well, Jesus is, you know, greater in me than he is in the world, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, all right, you know? <laughs> You know, so like he invites me to his house and I'm like, I'm like, bro, like I've been to many concerts by now. Like usually people don't invite people to their homes. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Like, you don't do that. You know, especially if you're the one performing. So this is my first time, my, my first real en engagement with the Christian, you know. So I guess now looking back, he was just trying to be hospitable, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I go and then I'm seeing his studio it's a nice studio. And I'm like, where'd you get this? This is a $5,000 Mac tower. Where do you get this at? He's like, the Lord gave it to me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, this is an 88 keyboard, Triton, blah, blah, blah. I know who uses this. Pharrell uses this. He's like, yeah, but the Lord gave this to me. I'm like, what? The Lord can't get, like, for me, in my perspective, I'm like, the Lord doesn't give you anything. Like, you have to, like. You have to steal it or you have to buy it. Like, that's my mm -hmm. perspective. And he was wow. just like, no, like, the Lord gives me everything. I pray and the Lord gave me a wife and I prayed. I did that. You know, and I'm just like, for me, I just I have no understanding. Yeah. And, and then, you know, three, four hours later, <laughs> I gave my life to Christ in his studio um, in Southern wow. Arizona in 2006. Uh, I, I really felt what really got me was, I think, was the how God could be your provider, how God could like care for you so much that he, he's, he, you know, he, he not only has your back, but he has the best interest in for you. Mm. And at that point in time, he really got me. So like I gave my life to Christ with that kind of message and unintentionally for like five or six months, I become like a Pentecostal with that dude. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you know, looking back at it, I understand what it is, but at that time, I had no idea. I was like, you know, so for like, for like five or six months, I become a Pentecostal. I go to church with him, you know, and, but, you know, morally I stop everything cold Turkey. Like I stopped doing drugs. I stopped doing everything. And obviously at this point in time, I was in a relationship uh, with this girl. I didn't stop having, you know, sex out of marriage at that time. That was hard. And, but I knew the relationship had to stop. Like I, I mm -hmm. knew that was bad. I was like, I can't be showing up with like, you know, this girl's embarrassing, you know, like yeah. it's an embarrassing situation. I, I hear the moralism being preached to me. Like the gospel I picked up at the time was like, repent and trust in Jesus. Stop smoking. <clears throat> stop looking at women. Stop sinning. Believe in the power of the spirit, you know, fight, use the sword. Jesus is bigger. Be the David, kill the giants. And, and that's the gospel I, I consume. Yeah. For the five or six months and so that that's how i judged my situation was like man i, I you know i just gotta mortify i gotta like uh manage my my behaviors and make sure that i don't slip because if i slip if i get caught slipping then 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 uh i failed jesus you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah like, i sure. failed jesus and, and then which in one sense is true but obviously it's not it's not to lose your salvation and get it again it's more hey i'm now under conviction you know and now i'm seeing this and it's turning back and getting that forgiveness and not like most people say oh it's this is who i am it's fine it's, let me right. be me you know self-care blah 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 whatever it's ah oh, yeah and because we still sin right i mean obviously right. it'd be nice if we didn't sin anymore right but we still sin I mean, even walking with the lord 5 10 50 years right so. Right. So like the gospel was exactly that it was like, if you get caught slipping, man, you know, you blew it. You, you got to do something or 
Mm. You really, really got to like fix Mendes' relationship with Jesus. It's kind of like you got in trouble with your mom. Like you got to yeah. go back and <laughs> like, how am I going to angle Bring it flowers. this time? <laughs> yeah. Like here, here you go, mom. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. I, I wrecked your car last week. <laughs> like now you're in for it. So, but that's the kind of gospel culture I was given. And then at another concert, um, I got introduced to like another church. And looking back at it, obviously, it was like a Calvary Chapel type church. And uh, at this point in time, like in 2009, 2009 is where I stopped, um, you know, the music industry and I stopped the music thing. And I was just like, you know, what? something about something. I don't know what it was, but something about something turned me off about secular rap and Christian rap. And ever since then, I just had this like, eh, like, I don't care about it no more. I, yeah. I just... I can't take it seriously. I understand it. I still have a, a, a weird relationship with it, but I, I just don't, I never picked it up again. So I just left it off. And obviously I was involved at Calvary for a while. Um, but it was at Calvary that I started to learn like a little bit more about the gospel. Like I started to pick up a little bit more things. Like I was like, okay, so, so this gospel thing, like, okay, I need to repent and trust in Jesus. Um, and I can't really do anything for my salvation, but Jesus really, really loves me. He really cares for me. Like he, he died so much. This is how much he loved me, like this much, right? He stretched out his arms. And I remember that quote from that one pastor one time, like he died for me this much, right? And yeah. I was like, wow. And then, and then I was like, and then he's like, you need to repent of all your sins, trust in Jesus because Jesus is going to come back in the rapture and you don't want to miss the rapture. And if you miss the rapture, that's how you know you're not saved. Mm. <laughs> and I lived under that tyranny of, oh man, Jesus is going to come back. And like, I don't want to miss the rapture. I got to make sure that I'm in this rapture. Like how, like, so since then when I was there, um, I was, I was like, you know, trying to like, look for the rapture, pray for the rapture, pray that I'm in the rapture, pray that I'm a Christian and pray that I'm yeah. not left behind, man. I don't want to be left behind because that was my, that was my new take on the gospel was mm. Jesus coming back and I don't want to be left behind. I want to go with Jesus, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, but, you know, looking back, I think there, there's positives I've learned at Calvary. You know, there's things that I'm thankful for. Um, I, I'm thankful for, you know, I, I was reading my Bible. Like I was never reading my Bible before I was reading my Bible. Um, I learned about verse by verse teaching, like expository preaching. Like I didn't know what that was until there. Mm. Um, I learned about evangelism. I think it was here where I learned um, that I got the sense of urgency for evangelism was at Calvary Chapel because they yeah. have a gr they have a great sense of the need for these people need Jesus. Yeah. Go yeah. out there. Go no, out there and get it people. done well. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I I picked that pretty quickly. And then um, you know, the delicacy of sound doctrine there that they 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 enforce, like, you know, teaching and there's bad things out there and I, I, the importance of church going there. Like you need to show up to be a Christian. You can't just be a Christian and not show up. So mm -hmm. I picked that up. Um obviously I pick up a lot of bad things. Like I picked up like Oh, you know, um, Calvinism is bad and reform theology, you know, everything else is bad. Just us. Like, the, you, you know, the rapture is the only view. Everything else is bad. Mm -hmm. And I, I picked up, I, 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 uh, I bought the shirt. I, I've been there, done that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I believe that. And I was like, I was, I was believing those things without really studying those things for myself i was just like conforming and not like i don't know like coming under my own convictions i was just like yes what what the pastor says yes what mm -hmm. my friend says and yes what this other coffee ca other Calvary like i i learned that there was a network of Calvary chapels mm -hmm. and they all competed for like like popularity or something hmm. like, oh no this guy mm -hmm. at this calvary over here said this and you know and he's like oh well this copy over here said this and blah blah, blah. and i was like interesting like, they're yeah so i was like more stock it depends who you follow yeah and i think 
you you would put more stock in whatever you followed or whatever. So yeah. I fell into that trap as well. So, but it was here. I, I intended to like, like I would go to church all the time, man. Like, obviously at this time I was single and you know how it is when you're single, you're, you're praying like 20 hours a day. You're reading every single book. You're like, you're, you're in college Bible studies. You're in Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings. You're chilling with the pastor when, when he's buying his latte, like you're out outside in <laughs> yeah. the church, like a lot when you're single. <clears throat> Obviously, when you're dad, when, when you're a dad with five kids, you don't do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was, I, was, much, I, I, no. I was one of those. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, no, that's definitely something. I mean, that happens. That seems to happen a lot with especially young believers where you get. And I think a lot of people stick there is they they kind of, well, so and so said that. And therefore, it's true. Um. I mean, I've shifted on a number of things over the years, but I mean, I was very much in the MacArthur camp, though I never went to Grace Church, but a lot of our pastors were from that. So it was kind of lockstep and there was a lot of that us. It was a Calvary Bible church, not a Calvary chapel, mm -hmm. but it was basically a similar thing, maybe slightly more formal uh, than like a Calvary chapel. And it was more uh, Calvinistic than not, but everything else was pretty much pretty much similar as verse by verse and premillennial rapture and, and things like that. But, you know, and obviously, you know, those are, those are great convictions to have, but you should have them. You should have them. You know, right. ultimately, yeah. We should teach the gospel and ultimately the gospel saves. I mean, there's smart people on all sides, you know, throughout church history and in any number of subjects. Uh, somebody's wrong, right? <laughs> somebody's wrong about eschatology and soteriology and, and even the beginning and, and ecclesiology about baptism you know, there's a lot of stuff out there if you really dig deep. But at the end of the day, it's Christ who saves us. It is Jesus alone, faith in him alone. The scripture is the sole authority alone. And yeah. those things are what makes us Christian. Those are things what makes us Protestant, if you will. But right. I would argue they're just biblical, right? Uh, just right. The, the core tenets of, of a historic Christian faith. So absolutely. Uh, but yeah, you want to have that conviction yourself. But it's easy to trust MacArthur or Piper or Sproul or, you know, any number of Calvary Chapel guys, Greg Laurie, Chuck Smith, you know, how oh, so-and-so said this yeah. or he read that or I love Spurgeon or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, yeah, but like they're not they're not the gospel, though, and they're certainly not scripture. Uh, but some people act like they are. So always. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we have to be careful not to like put put pastors that we like um, and we follow and you know, up higher than they should be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I know Charles Spurgeon wouldn't like that. He would be like, man. No. He's like, <laughs> and I'm it was, not... yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been prevalent for, I mean, centuries. I mean, just look at yeah, first yeah. Corinthians. I mean, how many, what first Corinthians one, three and five, I think, or one, two and five, Paul's talking about Apollos and Cephas and him and, you know, um, and uh, yeah. So yeah, we're, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Right. It, it was at Calvary that I was exposed to Spurgeon, though, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, my curiosity was like, you know, like like the movie The Lion King, you know, where he's like taking him, taking Simba on top of Pride Rock. Yeah. And he's like, everything that the light touches is our kingdom. Yeah. And everything that's in the dark, don't ever go there. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, what's in the dark? Well, like, why should I not go there? Because. And I was like, I always had that but why like i'm gonna go over there just you know see what's going on see, like i want to learn for myself like why yeah and, and and you know they unintentionally um gave me um the spilled beans by giving me a spurgeon quote and i was like oh and then i wrote down that name charles spurgeon and i was like i'm gonna look him up later and i looked him up and then I, I read one of my first books i think was from a charles spurgeon book and you know obviously that led to other things um um, yeah, that led me to a MacArthur circle, and obviously I learned MacArthur, and I be like, I love MacArthur for a while, man, and you know I learned everything, a lot of the stuff I learned from MacArthur, and then through MacArthur I learned through I, I learned RC Sproul, yeah, and like MacArthur for me was my gateway drug to the reform world, if that makes sense, and yeah. like MacArthur is a great like you my like be, this, yeah. like one of my friends says that MacArthur is a great on ramp but a terrible road to travel on in the reform world. 
And I was like, you know what? That, yeah, 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 that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love MacArthur. Yeah. I, I love his teachings. Like, I think he's a solid guy. He's been preaching for, for like so many years. 442 years. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I saw him <laughs> preaching at the conference recently. Yeah. And I was like, man, he's still going. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I actually met him a couple times, and he's very intimidating. Actually, that was very disappointing. Like I was like, I don't know what to ask. <laughs> he's fairly like, tall too. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I don't know what to ask you. I don't, I don't know. Like you're so like, uh, anyways. But yeah, I learned a lot. You know, I learned the real gospel from him, like justification by faith alone, and like obviously, you know, the doctrines of grace. Uh, Martin Luther, you know, did his thing in 1517. So I was exposed to like a broader, you know, conviction of, of, of Christianity there. And I was just like, whoa. So I soaked up as much as I could, you know what I mean? And obviously I gravi I gravitated, you know, when I learned through our when I learned about RC Spro, I was like, oh man, like, what's this guy about? And then I I learned I I I I just like gravitated to the Ligonier over the years. And then, yeah. you know. MacArthur kind of just like felt like kind of like Toy Story, uh, you know, where Woody <laughs> Woody gets like got boring, yeah. That's you know, gets left behind for Buzz Lightyear, and then Buzz Lightyear kind of becomes the popular toy. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I was like that man. I was like John MacArthur is my Woody, and like RC Pro was my Buzz, and I was like, <laughs> my whole room changed to Buzz Lightyear stuff. <laughs> That's. That that'd be a good thumbnail if I did wacky thumbnails. I don't really do wacky <laughs> thumbnails, but that'd be a good thumbnail. So were you in Arizona at this time, or did you already make your way to Colorado at this point? Um, did, yes, this was in Arizona. Um, I did have one episode where I did come to uh, Colorado for a year in 2008. I remember because Obama got elected and he spoke in Denver, and I remember that. Oh, uh -huh. oh, he sold out, and Those I were the, the like I remember that as a, as a landmarker. Like, I'll never forget that Bronco Stadium. And I was like, oh, whatever. Yeah. And and that's how I know. So I came here when when Obama was here and and I was here for a year. I, ha I have an uncle here and he was like, why don't you come over here and learn a trade? Uh, get away from Arizona, blah, blah. And I was like, all right. Um, so I was here for a year. And then after a year, I was like, um, nah, I don't I don't think I see myself doing this trade. I I'm just going to go back to Arizona. But it was in that year here where I, I did meet a meet a girl through my through my cousin who was at the at his church uh, through a worship church, and um, but she wasn't a Christian. And then I was like, I was like, I told my cousin, I was like, bro, like, what are you doing? Like, you're trying to hook me up with like non Christians, bro. Like, they have to be Christians. Like, you got to at least know they're a Christian. This is the like, prerequisite. Come on. They, like for me, it was. I was like, yeah. bro, oh yeah, like, no, I mean. Like, it's I very wise to stay that route. So, <laughs> yeah, I found out she was not a Christian, and I was like, "Oh man." Yeah. So I was like, true. "All right, don't even, uh, don't even missionary day." I was like, I, cool "I like you, but like, you're not, you're not a Christian." All right. Yeah. So I, I left, and then like it was like two years later, um, uh, we lost contact. So it was two years later. She emails me saying, saying that she became a Christian. Mm. And at this time, I was reforming. You know, I, like I believe the doctrines of grace at this time, and I was like. In my mind, I'm like, you can't really give your life to Jesus because Jesus is the one that elects you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I'm like getting too far off. That so office. I'm really happy that she became a Christian. So I was kind of skeptical. I was like, all right, yeah. well, that's good that you became a Christian, you know, praise God. But um, what church are you going to, you know? And um, so I was like, all right, well, um, here's a bunch of books. Let me send you a bunch of books. And I was a, I was a roommate at the time with my friend, and then I sent her half my library, bro. Nice. And then I was like, if she reads all these books and she gets back to me, that's how I know she's the one. So I did it kind of like a, <laughs> I did awesome. a, a, you know, I did like one of those, uh, what is it, Abraham sending his his servant to find, yeah, 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 yeah. So I did, I did the servant thing, and then I was like, if she reads all the books and she calls me back, that's how I know she would be the one. And then. <laughs> I, I, I sent the books and then she was like, I was like, you know, I gave her the record. I didn't tell her, you know, if she was going to call me back, then she'd be the one. Yeah. But uh, I was like, go ahead, read the books. Let me know. And then like three weeks later, I think she called me back. And then I was like, she's like, do you have any more books? And I was like, what? You finished all the books I gave you? Like, wow, you read fast. Like, wow, that yeah. took me like a couple years to get through that stuff. <laughs> 
I was like, I had no, I actually had no plan B. Like I, 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 you know, I was kind of pessimistic that you would not call me back, you know? And I was just like, all right, well, um, well, you want to do a Bible study together? Like, like, what are you interested in? Like, you want to go to Isaiah or Ezekiel? What do you want? (laughs) She was like, let's go to the Ezekiel or something. I was like, all right. (laughs) Um, so that's how I knew, uh, you know, she was the one. And so I I left Arizona in uh, 2010 and came in Colorado, 2011, uh, got married and we joined a church and then, you know, we've been here ever since, um, since 2011, man, and never looked back, you know? Oh, that's good. Praise God, brother. Um, I know you do, uh, with ministry stuff obviously we're going to talk about youtube here in a moment and just kind of online content and things um but you did a lot and do a lot of evangelism street preaching i know you are, i've heard some stories that you've shared and stuff why don't you just tell us a little bit about that and kind of what you see uh, the benefits the pros and the cons uh street preaching maybe you'd grace us with some stories uh, if you want or even just one fun story you don't have to but uh, and just any, I mean, just again, people, I think have a kind of different view depending on where you're at, um, whether you're in the East or the West, I've seen more street preaching. I saw a lot more in California than I do here for whatever reason, maybe it's less popular. I, I don't really know, but anyway, kind of tell us a little bit about kind of what you, what you were doing and, and obviously you get kids and, you know, stuff. Yeah, down. absolutely. So ever since my Calvary Chapel days, I've always been um engage in evangelism some one way or another mm-hmm. uh, i've done many many uh methods if you could say that like i passed out tracks i've done open air i've done uh bible studies at coffee shops i've done holding up street signs that says jesus loves you repent all that stuff i've done it all um uh, i've done I done a lot of stuff, man. Um, since then, and I even done um, prison fellowship for a couple years, and nice. been to the um, uh, state um, state prisons here in Colorado uh, jails, uh, Douglas County, a couple times. Um, man, so I, yeah, like um, recently I did this thing with uh, what's his name, Bill Adams. Uh, he has uh, George Whitfield Institute. Uh, okay. and he does sports outreach and he goes to the sport venues and he starts open air preaching when people are going into the sport venues and when they're coming out and he does a big outreach for the Super Bowl. And um, I, I've done one of those when, when Cincinnati, when the Cincinnati Bengals lost the Super Bowl recently. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. In LA. And um, so I done that one with him. Um, and it was endorsed by Living Waters and um, Easy, which is uh, Ray Comfort's son-in-law came out. Um, I met um, Ray Comfort's old pastor there in Bellflower, California. So, like, I've done that. I didn't do that this year because my, 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 my baby was born in January. And that took out a whole month of adjustment yeah. for my family. So the, the Super Bowl was the first week of February. And I was like, ah, oh, I can't make it to the Super Bowl to, to go out there. But um, – uh, yeah, evangelism has always been my favorite thing. Um, uh, one of my favorite things. Um, I know it's, um, a lot of people feel shy about it. And I met all sorts of Christians that are all over the place with it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, from all over the world, man. I met people from like South Africa, like Egypt, like you name it. Uh, I met a lot oh. of people, a lot of believers uh, doing that. And, you know, I worked with uh, mostly different type of denominations as well. So the Baptist guys, uh, 1689 guys, uh, reform Anglicans. Like I, I preach, you know, Ray comfort types. Um, I, I, I preach alongside a lot of different, um, denominations and got exposed to them through evangelism. Yeah. Um, it's That's real. Cool. It's needed. We need it. We, we need open air preachers. We need evangelism is, is one of the things that the church should be doing outreach as well as in reach, you know, um, you, you know, the pastor should not be the only one doing it. I believe it should be, uh, the members have the responsibility of reaching, um, evangelism as well. Um, not yeah. just 
uh, the pastors, a lot of people, a lot of Christian thinks, uh, a lot of believers think that, oh, that's just the pastor's job. That's just the elder's job. You know what I mean? It, and it's like, I used to think that, but the more and more I realized, like understanding the doctrine of the church and it's like, Actually, it's a whole team effort. It's it's the whole. If I could use that analogy, it's the whole mm-hmm. church engaged. Actually, evangelism runs through the, the local church. And evangelism is not this like renegade outside in like institution that exists. Right out here. That's a good way like, to put it. Yeah, you know, on the outskirts of the galaxy. You know, and, and you know what I mean. Like, no, it, it's not. It's not like Mandalore. <laughs> <laughs> we have this planet way out here mining doing his own thing and then everybody else is in here so yeah. like evangelism is in the church is in the institution in the organization this is the society of the church and it's it's a group effort everybody has a role they could be doing something engaging producing praying backing all that stuff there's always yeah. a place for somebody yeah, I mean, the, the body, I mean, the church body, we say the body of Christ, this and this and this. And sometimes we kind of blow past it. At least that's my assumption. I mean, I'm just me, but based on, you know, kind of how people's attitudes are about any given thing or what somebody might say or whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, but we're a body, though. Not every not not the bot, not everybody. Nobody is just a head or just mouth or just ears or something. But there's feet, there's kneecaps, there's legs you know right and so each each one's different and i mean i'll say this sometimes from the pulpit you know to try and encourage people like if everybody was the pastor well then there's no congregation right i'm right. the only pastor right? i'd like to have another pastor or two honestly but uh we'll hopefully get there but you know it's not it doesn't mean they don't have a job to do it doesn't mean there's not something for them to work on to pray for to give to to figure out how they can minister, whether that is evangelism or missions or supporting this or that, or, you know, taking in a homeless person or helping somebody who was part of the church a long time ago and bringing them, you know, back around, you know, maybe a kid who grew up in the church and they left, et cetera. So Mm. there's all these different things that, that we're called to do as the body of Christ. But you're right. A lot of, a lot of times people just think, I mean, I didn't go to seminary. I mean, I don't really know the Bible very well. And it's like, well, we'll read the Bible. (laughs) You know, right. study the scripture, go memorize right. it. You know, you don't need to memorize the entire thing per se. I mean, I could have guessed, but yeah, anyway, it's just, there's, there's all sorts of different things that sometimes we kind of get stuck. And then we think, well, I couldn't possibly blank. And then you're like, well, what are you doing to, to change that blank? And it's like, well, not really much. <laughs> so yeah, I, I get it. It's intimidating, you know, because there's a lot of atheists in the world, unfortunately, and evolution. And I don't know about this. And what if they ask me about, you know, the orange theory or like, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's like, you, you don't need to be an expert on evolution or anything like that to to go teach people about the gospel. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You're out there because you see a need uh, to share the gospel. It, it, the main thing is the gospel. You know, you're sharing uh, the life, the death, the resurrection, um, you know, the ascension and the triumph of Jesus with people. Yeah. Um, it's not your job to save them. You know, we don't have the power to save them. There's no magic in us. We don't do any magic tricks or anything like that. It, it's 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 just... A bunch of words that we're delivering and god is bringing those words that we give uh to life yeah um in them either then or maybe another another day you know and maybe someone else is going to come to water you know and you just well, never what, know what paul says yeah for you sure just, you never know you never know what the lord could do uh with something that you say you know because someone someone could be having a bad day they could be yeah. walking down the street. They could be having a terrible day. Uh, they, they, you know, maybe they just thought about suicide. Uh, maybe they're, you know, they're they're t- they're tired of taking drugs, or uh, they got, you know, they broke up with the girlfriend, or they they missed the bus, or you know, they you know the best team lost the Super Bowl, so they're angry. You don't know what people are going through. So when 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 you're bringing in the gospel, it you know 
it hits everybody differently and it, it never, you know, there's always somebody in that crowd somewhere that's yeah. actually, you know, paying attention that takes it in and stores it in for later. And the, you know, and God uses that yeah. to, you know, in many ways I see it. I, I, I saw, I saw it tremendously. Like I never have before when I went to the Super Bowl and I preached to the, like what, several thousand people, yeah, and I never experienced that type of spiritual warfare in my life. Mm. Like, like I, I've seen and I've encountered things, um, but never like that at at one time. You know, it, it, it's like it made me realize, like, wow, there's so many spiritual things here, and it, it's it's kind of like, you know, Julius Caesar fighting, you know, the the, the picks, you know. The Celts and it, it, it's crazy, yeah. In the spiritual sense, because it, it was the craziest experience I ever had, and it, it's the most realest experience I ever had when when it came when it comes to it when it came to evangelism. I was like, mm. wow, like you could actually die out here, <laughs> <laughs> like seriously, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was wow. crazy. Um, regarding like personal evangelism, and we'll then we'll get to your uh, your content creation, YouTube and stuff. Uh, what do you like or what's what's a good icebreaker or two that you like to use when you're in a random spot or if you if you're on mission sometimes it's like we're doing one thing but if you're going out with the evangelism team you're more like hungry or you're on a mission trip or something but what's something that you like to break the ice with to uh, to get people talking about the gospel that's always a hard one that's always a hard one. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are strangers and you just don't know them. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways. I don't think there's one way that rules them all. Kind of like the ring, the one ring. <laughs> <laughs> there's no one ring that rule them all. <laughs> there's many ways. Like people have different things. And, and yeah. So like when I was thinking about the Super Bowl, in my Super Bowl experience, I was like, there was like thousands of people thousands and i was like man how am i gonna have a serious conversation you know what i mean like how can mm -hmm. i trans trans um what's that word uh transfer or um transition, transition how can yeah. i transition from open air just like public like, announcement type mode to conversational type mode where mm -hmm. this is real and i found myself like passing out tracks and, and, and getting a lot of closed doors per se. So I, I was like, okay, I, I'm going to lean 100% in the spirit. Like I'm going to pass out tracks and I'm, I'm not going to bang the door down. I'm not going to force myself in, into a conversation. I'm going to allow the spirit to open the door for me. And I'm going to pray that I'm so sensitive to, I, I can see it. That's obvious. Mm. So I pass out tracks. And I was, no. Pass out, try it. Boom, boom, boom. No, 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 no. no. You know, the, oh, this person is drunk. I'm not, not going there. <laughs> you know, so, and then all of a sudden, I see these four guys, just like four homies, you know, and I was like, I, can, I, I could relate to them. I think they're Hispanic. So, okay, I'm going to go up to them and pass out this track. And then, and I, I you know, it was just like an, a natural conversation just sparked, bro. And I, I don't remember. There was like four different conversations at once. And somebody asked me something. And then, it, you know, I used the situation to my advantage. I was like, okay, so football. I was like, okay. Um, you know, I think I started, you know, pulling up football trivia. Mm. You know, I was like, who has the longest yards of touchdowns and um, in Super Bowl history? And they all started guessing and we started just, you know, that's the way I think I led into that. And then I was like, what do football players and then regular people like us have in common with football players? And then they're like, uh, I don't know, we're human or something. And I was like, um, we all die. Like there's one mm -hmm. day we're all going to die. That's one of the great equalizers between us and football players. And that's how we kind of got into it. And, yeah, so I think, you know, just everybody's different. Um, I don't think there's one way. Um, I, one way for sure to avoid is to not force it, not to, like, force it, 
trap them, mm-hmm. um, any tricks like to bait them, yeah, like to like fish them in and like to trap them and make them feel forced to stay. Like, hey, if you stay, I'll give you a, I'll give you a gift card to Wendy's. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I seen I've been involved where I've seen people do that, and it's like it's not genuine, and that's the situations that I I, I never want to do, you know? And, yeah. That's definitely the hard one. Uh, I think, I think being, I think being genuine is probably the most difficult, uh, I think for most people and especially with ladies and there's, I, there's certainly a, uh, opinions on, you know, whether women should open air preach or that sort of thing, uh, which I would, I would lean toward. No, um, just as far as practice and everything, but you know, even in general, most people aren't really outgoing. Most people are more reserved and this and that. But again, like you don't need to go to the square or go to the event necessarily, but you can at least pray for it. You can support it. You can drop a tract on a window, you know, going through canvassing and go to people's doors mm-hmm. or, you know, drop a good tip at the restaurant, put a tip, put a uh, track there. But also even having people over, I think hospitality is something that is massive oh, that yeah. a lot of people really discount. Yes, um, yes. That's and they a great like, point, bro. They wow, don't go all the, or if they do it, they don't go all the way with it, I guess. That's so. a great point. When I lived in Castle Rock, we've me and my family done that. I was like, how am I going to include my family? How can I expose my kids to like the resistance of the gospel because I would love them I would love them to see how, you know, Jesus works in situations like that. So we've yeah. we've done that and it took us about three and a half years to work around our neighborhood um, to invite every single home over for yeah. dinner. And I found that it was like over 12 dinners to actually get to a real conversation with people, 12 wow. dinners. The first dinner was like, Hey, what do you work? What do you with do? With the same people you're saying? Yeah. The same people. Just so like the Jones family, you invite the, them the 12th time yeah. they're over at your house. You're talking about it. Okay. And, and then the 12th time was like, Hey man, my, my, you know, uh, my son just had, you know, we just found out my son has cancer on his left knee and ah, man, I don't know what to do. And I'm, I'm about to mortgage my home to pay for the surgery. And, you know, uh, man, you know, and then I was like, mm-hmm. wow, that took like, like a bunch of dinners to get you to confess that, you know, yeah, well. and that was a big deal. Um you know, because before it was like, I don't want to say shallow, but it was just like people have fences and and, yeah. <laughs> and and it takes a long time to build that that kind of network. And I actually met a family. It was the Gonzalez family. And, you know, the wife was kind of Christian and he was familiar, but he was not living a Christian lifestyle, you know, and he has a powerful testimony, too. And it took me about six months to work up the courage, bro, to like invite him to my church. And, sure. and I, I, I finally worked it up and I, I brought him to, he, he came to church. And then ever since then, he's been there. He's been there for five, seven years now. Wow. It's my old church. I used to go to like two hours away. And um, so hospitality works. Yeah. Open your no, home, it cook up. It doesn't need, it does not need to be fancy cooking. Just make some spaghetti, throw, you know, you know, just simple stuff. Simplify it and bring them into your culture. If you do family worship, just do family worship. If you pray, just pray, you know, because they're, they're for the first time they're actually seeing a, a real what a real married married couple looks like. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Amen, they're seeing yeah. wow, these kids are actually nice. Yeah, like wow, like the husband actually likes to be home. Like he likes his wife. Like. Like wow, they actually have hymnals. <laughs> I actually yeah. got one of one of those from one of my um, Christian family members who live across the street, and they were Christians. And they're like, "You guys actually have hymnals?" And I was like, <laughs> "Um, yeah. Like, you guys go to church, don't you guys sing hymns?" And they're like, "No." Nah. And I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, you know, we sing hymns, you know, in my family worship." And they're like, "Wow, that is so cool. You have fam- you have hymns." And I was like, "Yeah, man. Like." You know, Christians has been singing hymns forever, man. You you should get one. And I gave him one. And it was just like a fascination for him to be like, wow, you guys actually have hymns. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So that's good, bro. Absolutely. Um, well, let me pull up your I'm gonna add your uh podcast here, Bible Theory Podcast. Everybody listening, go check out 
at Bible Theory Podcast. Um, ecclesiology for real people. Obviously, we've talked about your background, coming to Christ, having a music background, definitely talking about all sorts of different um, theological persuasions and, and looking at just different doctrinal things and overall uh, do you have kind of a, an impetus for your channel and kind of what you hope to continue, what you want to do, what you're continuing to do with uh, being on YouTube and producing content? Yeah. So, you know, I only been on YouTube for like almost, I think a year now. Okay. And, you know, I've been doing Spotify for a little longer, but um, I just started the YouTube channel. Obviously I'm a one man show right now, man, where I'm learning everything. Like, from everything and I'm, I'm still learning and I've learned a lot. So uh, you, you see differences and, and you'll see a journey from my first one to, to my newest one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate that journey um, being on YouTube taught me a lot. I met a lot of people, obviously you, Jason, Daryl King, a lot, you know, a bunch of good, good people out there. And I'm thankful for that. And, you know, my podcast I want to talk about the church and I want to talk about not just the doctrine of the church, but I want to help people connect the dots mm -hmm. to say the, the spiritual realities that you believe actually have physical embodiment. Mm. And what I mean by that is that people like to look at society um, and say, Oh, look, look at this, all these riots. You know, and look, you know, I think America went through a phase where there was like a lot of riots and it was really, really, really bad. Mm -hmm. and, and and almost nobody was asking the question like, yo, who, these people were, were probably raised in the youth group. A lot of these kids are, are former youth group guys. And, you know, where are the youth pastors? <laughs> where yeah. are these pastors that I used to disciple a lot of these kids, you know, mm -hmm. in Ferguson? And Good question. where's the where's the senior pastors coming out in in, in troves and preaching the gospel? Um, like I was so tempted, bro, to go to Ferguson and start like street evangelism to all these guys. And, mm. uh, you know what I mean? It, it was just like this is a not just a sad thing that we're watching all this violence and uh very sad decay but i was like like where's the church and all this like these people this is indicated to this to to that part of the town like if 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 you're out there and you're like where should i plant a church ferguson go mm. plant a church in ferguson if you're out there and you're like a missionary Maybe you're like, where should I go for to get experience to get my foot, my feet wet or something? Go to um, what's that town that burned down um, in Wisconsin? Oh, um, um, it's not Wichita, where what's his face that, went? The yeah, um, the white supremacist, terrible guy. Yeah, man, I the forgot people. the name. Um, Waukesha or um, that sounds right. I don't know. Kyle Go there. Right now, are you talking about? Yeah, that that little town he went up in there. It, it like it burned down the whole block or whatever. Like go plant a church there. Be a missionary there. Go go yeah. to Eastside Minneapolis. You know, go to Seattle. Go to Portland. Go to Washington D.C. Go to these places. Just just Google the riots, and then this is the places where the church needs to be, and it's indicative because. If these people were being discipled under care with their elders, being helped by their deacons, if these people were being taught by the gospel, these riots, per se, on this massive scale would probably would have never happened mm -hmm. uh, because the Christians, oh, not. Christians would not respond like that. Christians mm -hmm. don't terrorize. Don't Christians don't kill. Christians are not perfect like that, but I'm, I'm letting you know, like there, there's a difference like between protest and, and riot. You, you know what I mean? And yeah. Um, um, so the scriptures encourage us not, not to cause disorder, but to, to pray for our, for, for our leaders and Kings. And the church actually has um, like, it's a great mediator between the state and, mm -hmm. and, and the church. Right. So like these, 
you know, so I was like, man, all these people have a bad relationship with God. That means they have a bad relationship with the church. And you cannot and love within Jesus their family and, and everything else. Yeah. Right. It, 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 it trickles down. So I was like, a lot of people didn't look at that relationship with the church a, a lot as, as I, I thought they should have. Mm. So um, I started asking questions like, man, what, what is the church? Um, uh, basic questions. Who is the church? Um, all those things. Um, and and th that's what started you know, my podcast, um, those type of questions. Yeah. Well, keep it up. I know you're busy. You probably significantly more busy than me since you got what three kids under five. Is that right? Uh, five. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Three kids under five. Yeah. I lose count. Man. Our youngest is five. So yeah, I know how it goes and I barely feel like I have any time. So, but it matters brother. It really does. And it definitely, everyone should go check out if you have not already, uh, <clears throat> the Bible theory podcast, look at it. Uh, the Chicano Knox and his, perspective his spin on things it's always nice to get a little bit of different uh variety in one sense but also we often catch something someone else missed uh or something we missed uh, i learn a lot from just listening to sermons watching podcasts watching videos and uh, it's it's just helpful it really is and i think if nothing else just being a presence um really in in the enemy territory as it were that is online youtube and all the rest uh, we we need more, not less. So if anybody's ever, if you listening, uh, hearer or watchers wanting, well, maybe I should do a podcast too. Yeah, do it. Absolutely. Uh, be faithful with it. Try to do a little bit better each time. And I like to liken it to, you know, building a house and you're building it with bricks. You got to do the foundation. You're going to do it well and it's boring and, you know, it takes a while. And then you throw up the lumber and then you got to do this and that and put up the electrical and the drywall. And it takes time. You know, you're not going to build a house overnight, but um, to have to be a witness for Christ, to proclaim the truth, uh, it really matters. And it doesn't happen overnight, like you're saying, even with, you know, street evangelism, witnessing to people, having people over to your house, even ministering to people within your local church. You know, people who are Christians or maybe they just start coming again or they're there for the first time or whatever. You know, they're not going to act like mature Christ followers immediately. <laughs> right. You know, and and we don't, you know, if we're walking with Christ for a number of years, we still don't. And, you know, so being gracious in that moment, but also still finding that tension and pushing towards, hey, well, you know, this is what Christ says. This is what the gospel is. This is what this means to be a Christian, et cetera without being overbearing, I think as well. That's always hard to find that balance sometimes, but it matters. So I appreciate you, brother. I really do. Do you have any last words you want to finish us with, out with? Yeah. And whatever you do, serve Christ with all the glory to him and don't waste your time with uh, petty things, small things, uh, go, grow in Christ in the knowledge of Christ. Cause that's what Peter says to the church you know, grow in, in the knowledge of Christ. Don't stay put. Mm. If you're, if you don't understand something, that's fine. You know, go ahead, pick up and, and read, pick up and read, take up and read um, the word of God. And, it, you know, and there's no other hope in this world, but in Jesus and join a church, follow your elders, serve it, love it, preach it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, repeat <laughs> that's right amen brother well this has been a pleasure uh like i said everyone i recommend his podcast there the bible theory podcast check that out on youtube that's on spotify as well you said yeah it's on spotify and apple oh, podcast awesome. as well and uh rumble actually i'm trying to get on rumble but yeah i'm on there people tell me that too i'm like uh i'm too busy i don't have <laughs> enough things to worry about <laughs> yeah maybe someday maybe someday well, anyway, it's been a pleasure, brother. God bless and have a good rest of your day. See you, man. Thank you.